one aspect of it, right? The state is representing these particular interests. That's very important, right? The state is representing these interests. The question is, how did the state come about representing these interests? It came about representing these interests from the social stratification that was transposed from society into the state. Okay, so that's the first level, right? That's, the, that's sort of our intro level. The idea then becomes, number two, well, I don't want to mess up my paper. Yeah, I didn't use numbers, so this is good. Number two, the question is, what is the role of the... Right? The question becomes, what is the role of the political philosopher? I'm not a political scientist, right? The role of the political scientist is to do regression analysis and to figure out the interrelation of individual social demands based on census and blah, 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 blah. Very, very important stuff. Work very closely with political scientists. My, my, my best friend here, shout out to Dustin Berna, um, is, is a political scientist. I vibe well with, I vibe the most well with political scientists because we speak the same language. Our functions are different, however. The function of a political science scientist is profoundly different in my terms, and this is, this, is, this is really not my terms, right? This is Lasky, right? He says, what does he say? He says, the political philosopher is concerned with the balance of interests, right? It seems like such a sort of, you know, what does that mean, ambiguous claim, but it's reinforced by, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of very, very dense political theory to get to this point, so I'm consolidating a profound amount of information into a very sort of, you know, ultra-dense analysis, hopefully if I do my job well, and I feel good so far, so we'll see how this works out. But the idea is, the function, what is the function of the political philosopher? The political philosopher recognizes the representation of um, social stratification within the bureaucracy, right? So for example, before YouTube became, before I was aware of YouTube, Back in, I don't even know, do I have the book here? Um, it's not even anything to show, and I'm not trying to show it to sell or any of that crap, because you can get it for free, and actually I don't. <laughs> um, oh, I know I do. I do. So me and my homeboy, shout out to the greatest human being on the planet that's not related to me, Chioki Ayanson, uh, and Mary Bell Gonzalez. Me, Chioki, this is crap, don't buy it, right? I mean, it's not crap, it's actually friggin' genius, but don't buy it, you can get this for free. It's not a plug. But just to show you, right, this is the thing, the, the, the thought process, this is a means of demonstrating. So me, Chioki, and um, Mary Bell, during the protests, the, the, the nationwide protests within the Hispanic community against HR 4437, which was sort of one of the foundational sort of very, very uh, socially incorrect uh, pieces, <laughs> pieces uh, within our government's history where in a sense, and I'm generalizing here, the tone was perceived as the felonization of sort of the Hispanic embodiment, right? The fact that you could potentially, and I know that this wasn't necessarily the bill or so on and so forth, but the interpretation was that the United States government was attempting to felonize basically not Hispanic identity in some sort of esoteric sense, but the physiological looking like a Mexican could potentially wind you in jail. This is where my antennas go up, and I'm like, if there's something that I'm going to work for, if there's something I'm going to work against, is that. Right? I can't support that. I can't support, as much as I love the United States of America, and I'm definitely willing to die for my country, the idea is, you know, you're not just going to bow to the injustices that our country does, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Everybody has their fight. Everybody has stuff that they want to do. I'm not fighting for most of the stuff, but that's the type of stuff that I fight for. So we organized with, and, and you can see the image. I should have the image up. Maybe I'll find the image. I'm not sure if you can read it because it's all, it's all uh, sort of fuzzy. But it's a politics of discrimination, right? What is the function of the philosopher? Is to identify a politics of discrimination. And what does that mean? The example that I use in the book, Chioki and Mary Bell, we use in the book, as just, you know, I was in grad school. I wanted to get something out to just have it out in the world. Then I discovered YouTube, and YouTube trumps everything. YouTube trumps any press anywhere in the world, right? But the idea at the time was to let the world know what's going on, right? The idea that our government functions in, a, in an ethical sort of ether in which all of the actions of the state are inherently good and just because it is an action of the state now, it's a, it's, it's a bit fascist, right? It's a, it's, and also ridiculous. No, 
The idea is that the state at one time thought that segregation was a good idea because it, it reinforced and represented the social stratification that benefited the interests of white people over black. Right? So that this interest-based social stratification is manifest within the state, and the state proposes bills, those bills become laws, those laws are enforced, people who break the law go to jail, and this is why Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, and such um, were as profound as they were in sort of their social movement understanding and their awareness of social movement, because it isn't always about obeying the law. Right? There, there comes a point at which very specific aspects of the laws can be, whether intentfully or not, directed to the detriment in the reverse of what um, Rawls initially said. Right? The, the, the antithetical point, that the law was constructed not to the benefit of those who are least benefited, but to the detriment of those who are already least benefited. Right? So, like bully law, bully legislation, like legislation that is set into motion in order to bully um, uh, an already marginalized community. That's not cool, right? That's not cool. So what we do as academics, one thing I definitely do is <laughs> follow in a play. You can't do that, right? You can't do that. That's not fair, right? You can't felonize someone for looking a certain way. You can't tell somebody, hey, I want to see your, I want to see your citizenship papers because you look like a Mexican. I mean, what does that even mean, right? So the idea is, and, and you know, it wasn't just me. Everybody did. Everybody within the Hispanic community that that gave two craps was out protesting, uh, and we know how that turned out. The idea is a recognition of the function of the political philosopher. Now, with that bit of sort of ghetto philosophy behind us, now the more advanced aspect is a recognition of where exactly the political philosopher gains his traction in this process. The interest-based dynamics within our stratified society the interest-based dynamics within our stratified social sort of structure manifest through a representation within the state. It is the responsibility of the political philosopher, political philosopher, to challenge the mode of representation then. Right? And this is where Foucault comes in. Foucault literally wrote the book on this. Right? And it would be hard pressed for someone to do a better job than Foucault. He he it's, I mean, genius is an understatement, right? Foucault recognized that the representation of social stratification as manifest within political power in terms of legislation, the ability to incarcerate, the ability to oppress, is only powerful insofar as that representation is, is just sort of assumed to be the case, right? If you assume it to be the case that the political structure is in place to represent and that the representation of the political structure appeals to the vast majority of the population, the point is, well, why would we need to change the representation within the political structure? You don't need to change the, the representation because the vast majority of people are okay with it. The point is, well, no, that's not cool, right? Because just because you appeal to the representation of the populace as such, the mass, the herd, which already you guys know how I feel about the herd. You see me do freaking 60 hours worth of lecture on Nietzsche, so you know how I feel about the herd. Who cares about the herd? What about the marginalized population? What about the population of people who excel? What about the outlier communities, right? Those who are at the utmost top, and I don't just mean sort of the 1%. Uh, our contemporary vernacular is so freaking overburdened with this 1% crap, right? I, I mean excellence, people who excel. It could be money, it could be music, it could be art, it could be education. The excellent upper social strata, the highest echelon of whatever, and those people who are subaltern, uh, to be frank, right? Those outlier communities, we have to have representation within the state from members of those communities as well. So, for example, individuals who are LGBTI, who are and make up a very significant aspect of our social strata, if you will, demographically speaking, but in no sense are anywhere near a majority, need to have representation within the state in order to address the needs of members of the LGBTI community. It's like, duh, right? The idea is that you can't you can't facilitate this transformation in representation without a recognition of the function of representation to begin with.